me and my thanks to uh, Linda's for all of you that gave up spring break and this gorgeous morning to sit here inside and talk about self-awareness. <laughs> so um, I want to add just one word to the title, first of all, the title of self-awareness, and that word is virtuous. So what I would like to talk about is a virtuous self-awareness, and I would like to do that uh, starting with a contrast. So the contrast is the opposite of virtuous self-awareness. And in order to talk about that contrast, I want to make use of a very ancient uh, schema in the church for talking about human vices. And that is, the, uh, we sometimes hear it referred to as the seven deadly sins, um, but I will refer to it as the seven capital vices. So let me give those to you first. The capital vices, and if you're taking notes, okay, it's very important to put them in the correct order. Okay, the capital vices are pride, envy, Anger, sloth, avarice, gluttony, and lust. Pride, envy, anger, sloth, avarice, gluttony, and lust. Now, this reflection on the uh, capital vices uh, came into the Western Church from Eastern monasticism. So the monastic movement, as you know, began in the Eastern Church. Began, um, it's associated especially with St. Anthony the Abbot. So when it's a, it's a, a production, really, or a creation of the fourth century of the church's life. And this reflection on the capital vices began as a reflection on the problems that monks have when they live together and when they try to dedicate themselves uh, seriously to the spiritual life. But what the rest of the church recognized is that these vices are not only found in monasteries, they're found everywhere. So this is one of the most important things to understand about the capital vices. First of all, they are vices, not sins. So vices are bad habits, just as virtues are good habits. So. And habits lead to acts. So virtuous, virtue leads to good acts. Vices lead to uh, evil acts. So these are vices. That is to say, they are bad habits. They are called capital vices. The word uh, capital comes from the Latin word caput, which means head. They're called capital vices because they lead to other sins. Not just the sins that are proper with these names, but to other sins as well. That's why they're called capital vices. And the other thing that I want to say about this is, as we go down this list, we might be able to say, okay, uh, I think I'm clear on that one. You know, that one's not a problem, or whatever. And if that's the case, I congratulate you. But these... <laughs> Uh, these vices are really tendencies that are found in everyone. So that's the first thing that I would want to address to this question of self-awareness. Self-awareness. We have to be aware, if you will, of the darker side of our personality. We have to have some awareness. And what we have to recognize is that all seven of these are tendencies that we all have, each of us have them as tendencies in ourselves. And uh, the moral challenge, of course, is to deal with them constructively, 
you know, to avoid the sin, but more deeply, I think, to understand what each of these, in a sense, is a perversion of, or an inversion of. So they all involve things that human beings do all the time, also in a healthy sense. So uh, let me go down the list and, and give you at least a working definition. Uh, one last thing. Let me say one last thing about the order. I want you to notice number seven, okay? Lust is the least deadly of the deadly sins. Pride is the deadliest. So, and one other thing to notice is that the first four sins tend to be more spiritual than the last three. The last three tend to be more bodily or more material. So, and I, I for, for our topic this morning, I, I really want to concentrate on the, uh, the first four. Sorry, um, <laughs> Lust is everybody's favorite capital vice, but I'm not going to have a whole lot to say about it this morning. So uh, let's go down the list. Pride is a distorted sense of the self. That's the working definition I want to give to you. Typically, we think of it as an overweening sense of self, so an excessive self-importance, egotism. But I want to argue that there is an inverse version of pride too. When we don't esteem ourselves enough, that can be prideful. I'll come back to that. Envy is a word we need to be very precise about using. Um, most of us use the word jealous when we want, when what we actually mean is envy. So um, we'll say, I'm jealous of so and so. Um, because she can do this, or because he has that, or, or whatever. When actually what we mean is envy. Envy. So let, let me give you just a, a, a distinction there. Three terms, actually. Jealousy is a part of um, the, the, the great love that we call eros. So it is a part of erotic affection, erotic love. It is part and parcel of eros that a man and a woman who fall in love desire a certain exclusivity in that relationship. So there is a healthy possessiveness that is built into eros. And what that healthy possessiveness is about is the man and the woman detaching themselves, you know, from their parents and establishing their own family. Now, I say detach somewhat because um, I think it's very important for family life that a couple and a new family remain engaged with their families of origin. So, jealousy is a distortion of that possessiveness. It's an irrational fear of losing the person I love. That's what jealousy is, to be perfectly precise about it. Envy involves a comparison of myself to others or to someone else. And in envy, what happens is this is the only sin that has no positive reward. Everyone can understand why people fall prey to avarice, gluttony, or lust. The, the, the rewards there are obvious. Envy has no positive reward. It begins in misery and ends in misery. What happens when I am envious is I feel badly about myself because of the excellence of someone else. So I feel badly about myself because so-and-so is a better athlete, or so-and-so has better social skills, or so-and-so is a better politician, or so-and-so has more money, or nicer cars, or whatever. That's envy. The third term that I want to introduce here is covetousness. Covetousness. It's, uh, it's related, it's somewhat related, that's why I'm making these distinctions. But in covetousness, it's not simply that I feel badly about myself because so-and-so has 
uh, a nicer car or so-and-so has a nice, a more, more beautiful wife or whatever. But I actually want the car or the wife. That's covetousness. So mostly here, the important thing is to understand the distinction between envy and jealousy. And as I say, envy has no positive reward. It begins with, I feel miserable about myself. I'm comparing myself to other people, and I end up feeling even more miserable. The next uh, of the vices is anger. We just had this gospel this week. Um, anger, uh, first of all, is a feeling. Before it's a vice or an act, it is a feeling. And the feeling has a positive function in our psychological life. It's, it belongs to the arousal emotions. And what happens is, um, when someone attacks me, I will have an arousal response of anger in order to defend myself. So it actually begins physically. Anger is a very physical emotion. And it's not just if someone attacks me. It's if someone attacks my family. Actually, we will be more, more angry if someone attacks the people we love than a personal attack. And beyond the family, the community, the church, the nation. Anger is about self-defense. As a feeling, as an emotion, it's about self-defense. So the sin of anger comes in if, uh, if we do not respond properly to that feeling within us. So um, we need to gauge whether something that's happened is actually an attack. Many times it's not, and especially, mostly when we talk about anger now, we're talking about it in a psychological sense. So is it an attack or isn't it? And did so-and-so say that, you know, because um, he's attacking me personally? Or am I just, is my view of this situation distorted? And that's what I'm going to come back to again and again on this question of self-awareness. Virtuous self-awareness is realistic. Anything other than that contains some kind of distortion. So anger really becomes a serious sin when we allow it to smolder, you know, for days, weeks, years at a time. That's where you really have the deadly sin. So when siblings, for instance, get angry with each other and don't talk to each other for years at a time, probably there is a sin of anger involved. Sloth is the most misunderstood of the seven. And actually, it's so misunderstood that I'm going to use a different name for it. The name is Achadia. That's the Latin name for it, Achadia. Sometimes you will hear this uh, anglicized as acedia, but it's about the same thing. Sloth is not laziness. That's why I want to use a different term for it. Probably the closest, uh, the closest accurate translation of achadia is depression. Depression. So what happens in Achadia is, this is a very, very deep vice. What happens in Achadia is at the deepest level of our being, where we have any kind of consciousness of ourself as coming forth from the creative hand of God. Instead of feeling joyful at the gift of existence, we feel sorrowful. And in the oldest list of the capital vices, the name for sloth is not achedia, but tristitia. Tristitia, which means sadness. So those are the four I'm going to spend the most time on, but let me just very quickly. 
go to the other three. Avarice, um, I prefer that name to greed. Um, avarice is the Latin based word, but um, <clears throat> avarice is uh, a disordered desire for money and possessions. Gluttony is a disordered desire for food. Very interesting to me, of all the deadly sins, this is the one where the language of morality has actually percolated up into popular consciousness. <coughs> because we now talk about eating disorders. Eating disorders, okay? Every vice is a disorder. So gluttony is a disordered desire for food. And sins of gluttony are uh, sins when we eat too much, when we make ourselves sick, or when we eat in such an uncareful way that we imperil our, our health. That's gluttony. And then lust, the least deadly. The, the catechism, this is the definition of the catechism of the Catholic Church for lust. Lust is the disordered desire for sexual pleasure. And I want to use that definition to point out a general pattern in all of these vices. The evil of lust does not lie in desire and it does not lie in pleasure. These are things that God gave us as part of the gift of our existence. The evil of lust lies in the lack of order. And you can say that about all the deadly sins. In one way or another, they begin with something healthy and they distort it. So, any questions about the general list or the definitions? All right. Well, that's the groundwork then for what I want to talk about, and that is the way the capital vices distort our self-awareness. So pride is the deadliest of the deadly sins. So what pride well, really concerns is the way in which we value ourselves. The virtue that counters pride is humility. And again, um, our society does not understand this term properly. Humility is not self-abasement. Humility is a true and proper estimate of oneself a true and proper estimate of oneself. And in the case of humility, you can see Aristotle defined a virtue as a median between two extremes, one by excess and one by defect. So if humility is the, uh, the golden mean here, and pride is the vice that offends against humility, um, there is the excess by, or the, the, uh, the defect by excess. So that's usually the way we think of pride, an overvaluation of the self, egotism, <clears throat> self-centeredness. Part of pride, I think, is also an excessive desire for control, that I have to be in control. I'm the one that has to be in control. This can be devastating in relationships and in marriages in particular. So that's usually the way we think of pride. And again, if we want to talk about how it affects a virtuous self-awareness, we can be voluptuously self-aware when we're pride, proud, prideful or proud. The, the, the problem is not simply self-awareness, but the way we value ourselves. So humility, uh, humili by humility, I acknowledge that I am one person among many. 
So um, that I am one part of this relationship we call marriage, one part of the family, one part of the extended family, one part of the workplace, one part of the parish community, the local community, and so on. The problem with pride is um, that it's difficult for, for us to acknowledge that. We tend to think of ourselves as the most important part. Self-centeredness is another adjective for pride. Now I want to talk about the other side of pride, which is, um, a, we don't really have a name for it as a vice, at least I'm not aware of it, but we usually refer to it as a low self-image or a defective self-image. This can also be a vice. And it's a very difficult vice to deal with because many people confuse it with the virtue of humility. But if I do not value myself sufficiently, okay, I will not put myself forward as a part of the family, you know, a part of the extended family as a part of the workplace, a part of the community, the parish, and so on. A part of the tribe, if you will. I will not put myself forward. So, and there's a certain pride in that also. It's a form of pride that we're not accustomed to thinking of, but um, this, that form of pride, okay, the, the low self-esteem part of pride, goes into envy and sloth as well. And we can see the problem with pride most clearly in depressed people. Depressed people. And what I'm talking about is, if, uh, if, if I am depressed, and I've struggled with this a lot, more so in my earlier years than now, um, it is very easy to manipulate or try to manipulate people from the, the point of view of depression. To try to get other people to take care of you. Or... Um, uh, to try to, to uh, provoke people, in a sense, by back, by, by back roots. So this can be prideful also. Um, depression affects a whole system. So if one member of the family struggles with depression, it's everybody's problem, not just the depressed person. And that's, that's part of what I'm getting at. So um, this also, depression obviously is also a medical condition. So someone who struggles with depression really needs to have exhausted all medical um, explanations and treatments um, before we really deal with this as a spiritual problem, the problem of, of Achadia. But are you following me? The golden mean here on this first issue, which is, the issue of the image I have of myself. The golden mean is humility. By humility, I know who I am, what I am capable of, and I'm willing to share myself with others. If I err on the side of pride, I overvalue myself, or self-centeredness, let's put it that way. If I err on the side of uh, low self-esteem, I'm, I'm going to be making other people pay the price for that also. So, Either of those extremes has to be brought to the middle, to a, a true and proper estimate of the self. And that's the basic statement about self-awareness. Envy. As I said in defining it, it starts in misery and it ends in misery. Of all the deadly sins, this is the one that is most difficult to admit. I think that's in the nature of the vice, but I think that we have one additional complication in dealing with it in democratic societies. And that is Jefferson's great phrase, all men are created equal. Okay, that is true. That statement is absolutely true if you're talking about human dignity. We are all equal in our human dignity. But we are not equal in our gifts. Some have been given more than others in this or that respect. Obviously, some have more money than others. Some people are better looking than others. 
Some people have better athletic prowess than others. And so on. You can go down the whole list. Envy has its own interpretation of that phrase, that sentence, all men are created equal. Envy, when it hears that sentence, interprets it to mean no one can be better than me. No one can be better than me. And there is a world of difference between those two statements. Do you see what I'm getting at? No one can be better than me. I feel miserable about myself, and any kind of excellence I see around me makes me feel more miserable. Now, envy begins with a very serious distortion of the self-image. So envy begins at the other end of pride. So the, the, the low self-image. Envy begins with a low self-image. And instead of dealing with the low self-image by trying to build the self-image up, what envy wants to do is drag everybody else down to its level. That's the real strategy of envy. So no one can be better than me. Um, in democratic societies, the name, the adjective that applies to the word equality is equalitarian. Equalitarian. We live in an equalitarian society. It usually goes by the French uh, translation of that word. Equality becomes égalité in French. And the word is egalitarian. You may have heard that word. Egalitarianism can be very easily taken over by envy. So what, what I'm saying is, because we live in an egalitarian society, we are doubly predisposed to not wanting to own up to our own envy. But envy involves a very, very serious distortion in the way we look at reality beginning with the distortion in the way I look at myself. And then you have sloth, achedia. So depression is not an exact translation of that term, but I think in the phenomenon of depression, we see most of the characteristics that apply to the classical definition of achadia. It is also sometimes called the devil of midday. The devil of midday. So it is sometimes considered laziness because, as you know, severely depressed people do not feel like doing anything. But sloth is not about inactivity. You know, it's about the attitudes that lead to the inactivity. So it could be a clinical depression. It could be a milder form of depression. But the spiritual dimension of the vice is, um, again, at its deepest roots, where... Um, I experience myself as coming forth from the creative hand of God. This is a very deep, very deep vice. I experience sorrow instead of joy or instead of gratitude. So um, what corresponds on the virtuous side to achedia is uh, gratitude. So these four together, I think you can see from the way I've talked about them, involve very serious distortions of our self-awareness. And because they involve distortions of our self-awareness, they involve a distortion in the way we relate to others. And that's the thing to remember about all vices. They are all detractions from the supreme virtue, which is charity. They are all derogations. They are all devaluing. 
of the, uh, the supreme virtue, which is charity. They all make us less loving and less suitable for love. So quick word on the last three then. Avarice, um, again, it applies to um, our attitude towards our wealth or our possessions. So a number of years ago, um, I was, I think most of you may know this, I was the dean of the seminary in St. Louis for uh, a, a number of years. And um, at one point, this probably was at least 10, maybe 12 years ago, we were contemplating doing a capital campaign in the archdiocese. And uh, at, we brought in a group of pastors to meet with the people that were planning this campaign. And uh, eventually, the pastors prevailed. They did not want to do a capital campaign. Pastors never want to do capital campaigns <laughs> or ask for money, believe it or not. Um, they consider fundraising to be be below their dignity um, as pastors, when the real problem is they don't have the skills. They don't have the training for doing it. But anyway, I digress. <laughs> one of the priests uh, was the pastor of one of the wealthiest parishes in St. Louis and probably in the country. And he just made the comment that uh, he was kind of neutral. He could have gone one way or the other on the capital campaign. But he just made this comment, which it, this is practical wisdom, the practical wisdom of a pastor. He said, I don't know what it is, but wealthy people have more money to give away, and they are less inclined to give it away. He said, wealth is like an addiction. And that's a good way to look at avarice. For some people, the more they have, the more they have to have. And they just really become driven. The acquisition of wealth and possessions becomes the driving motive of their lives. And that's where the saying of Jesus, the love of money is the root of all evil. That's where it applies. Where money becomes your religion, you're dealing with the vice of avarice. Gluttony has not really, I mean, it's one of the deadly sins, so it's always been with us. But um, I think it's become an epidemic in the wealthy societies of the West. We, we eat way too much, and I don't accept myself from that either. We eat way too much. So the Lenten fast, I think, is a good corrective to that particular vice. St. Vincent de Paul said to his followers, it doesn't hurt you to get up from the table a little less than satisfied. It's just a way to maintain perspective. And now in this country, it's not just that we have too much food, but our pets do as well. So we have <laughs> overweight pets. I don't know what the name of that vice is. <laughs> And then lust. I'm not going to say any more about lust. You have, the, uh, you have the definition. Lustful people look at themselves incorrectly and they look at others, especially the objects of their lust, and stress object when you're dealing with lust. But in every case here, you're dealing with distorted self-awareness. So to go back um, to, to where I started with pride, the beginning of a virtuous self-awareness is the virtue of humility. <clears throat> and again, that's, humility is about the proper estimate of oneself and one's value. And the point of that virtue as the point of all of the other virtues is to feed into the supreme virtue, which is charity. When I have a true and proper estimate of myself, I know that I am worth sharing in a relationship, that I have something to give to others, and that I am worth receiving the love of others, both of those things. And in the end, that's what a virtuous self-awareness is about. So I, I would like to end by talking about uh, just a couple of strategies.
for dealing or achieving the uh, virtuous self-awareness. Probably the most important single strategy is the examination of conscience. Now most of us, when we learn to go to confession, also learn what the examination of conscience, of, of conscience is about. Typically, I think most of us use the Ten Commandments as kind of a checklist for ourselves. We can also use, if you remember them, the capital vices as a checklist for ourselves. I think the problem with the way most of us examine our consciences is that we always start off with the negative. We're always looking for what we've done wrong. I think it is much healthier to begin the examination of conscience by thanking God, you know, for another day or another week or month of life. So begin in a spirit of thanksgiving. And then to look at what we've done with God's gifts. Some, maybe even most, of what we've done with God's gifts is to the positive. And we need to remember that as well as our faults. Again, in a spirit of thanksgiving, we should acknowledge before God what he has allowed us to do with his gifts. You know, thank God. You know, thank God. I could help my friend. She was having a bad day that day, and I could help her. Thank you for that opportunity. Thank you for the wisdom you gave me um, I don't think I would have ever thought of the advice I gave her if you hadn't helped me, Lord. So begin, begin with a, a great prayer of thanksgiving, praise and thanksgiving for the gift that God has given. And then for the opportunity to do any good we have done with that gift. And only then to look at what we have misused or what we have neglected. So that's the first, that's the first tool the examination of conscience. Then very closely related that to that is sacramental confession. Can't say enough about this, about sacramental confession. Um, one of the problems we have in the church right now is we have this kind of downward spiral. Fewer people are coming to confession, so priests schedule less time for it, which means even fewer people come. Last year, Bishop Sheridan sent out a note to the priests and said, during Lent, at least, schedule more times for confessions. And uh, not to blow my own horn, but um, at St. Peter's, I've scheduled confessions four nights a week. And people are coming. People are coming. So what I say to people, especially people that come and say, I haven't been to confession in three years or five years or 20 years, there are a uh, number of things I always say. Number one, we take things more seriously when we say them out loud. So it's one thing for me to say, you know, with my eyes closed, Lord, I'm sorry for that angry outburst. But it's quite another thing when I have to say to my confessor, I keep having these angry outbursts with the same person. It makes me recognize, number one, how serious the situation is. And how the situation really demands more from me than what I'm giving to it. And especially, it makes me take more seriously my resolution to do better. I take that more seriously by saying that out loud to someone else. Second point is accountability. Now, Catholics as a community make fun of themselves and we are made fun of by others for the phenomenon, that, the phenomenon that we call Catholic guilt. Okay, By and large, maybe in some instances there's too much of that. But the thing that we can pride ourselves on as a community, not pride in this sense, okay, but we can pride ourselves on is the sense of accountability that we have. The fact that we all have to go to confessions, including the Pope, makes us more accountable as a people. And accountability, I think, is a tremendous aid to growth in the spiritual life. So if, if I have a regular confessor in particular, and I confess to the, the confessor uh, on a regular basis 
Look, I'm working on this sin of anger or irritability or impatience. That's a way of, of my holding myself accountable. And it's a way to grow also. Third thing that I always say, and this is the most important thing to say about sacramental confession, is that it's a sacrament. So we truly encounter Christ there, who died for our sins. That's where what happened on the crucifix is applied to me and my sins. As a systematic theologian, I very much believe that a substantial part of the agony that Christ encountered on the cross was his awareness of every single human sin, of every single human being that ever existed or ever would exist that he was dying for. So that's where it happened in the broadest sense. And in the sacrament of penance, that's where Christ's love is applied to me. Christ's love and mercy is applied to me. So I really receive divine forgiveness through the ministry of that priest. And I can leave those sins there. I do not need to torment myself with guilt or shame about them, you know, for years afterwards. And the other thing that the sacrament is about is a gift of strength, of moral strength. So it may be incremental. You know, we may find ourselves falling back into the same bad habits. But if we look back over the pattern of our lives, we're likely to notice things like we don't fall back into them as quickly. They're not as severe. And I repent of my sins more quickly. All of that is a gift of moral strength. And in some cases there really can be a total cure. So, sacramental confession is the second. Between the two of them, I think we develop a self-awareness, an awareness of ourself. And the last thing that I want to say about this, the most important transition in dealing with our growth in virtue and our conversion from vice the most important stage is when we can catch ourselves in the act. So I may have a habit of gossiping, a bad habit of gossiping. I may recognize when I examine my conscience, I should not have said that. But the supreme achievement, if you will, of the moral life is when in the act itself I recognize I should not be talking like this. I'm going to change the topic. So that's when our growth in self-awareness, virtuous self-awareness, has really reached um, the level that it needs to be at. So, uh, in conclusion, the only other thing I'd say is, in dealing with these vices, we can't do it ourselves. One of the saddest features of our moral life is that there is a certain inevitability about sin. We are not predestined to sin. Nothing forces us to sin. But because of the weight of sin in the fallen world and in our own lives, because of the vices we have in our own lives, there is a certain inevitability to it. It does not compromise our freedom because every sin is still a choice. So what grace is about is reaching us in that choice so that we can face down that lack of freedom, if you will, and the inevitability of sin. And where before we experienced weakness, now we experience strength. So that's what I have to say on the issue of self-awareness. How do we, uh, what is the stance in terms of how we as Catholics revere the Pope with regard to sin? You had mentioned earlier, yes, he goes to confession, obviously. Uh, and then in the outside world, they think that we believe that he is um, somehow without sin. Um, well, he's not. Well, no, he's I a human being, so he can't be. Right. So is there, um, do you have any advice in terms of 
uh, the the hierarchical <coughs> setup of that, how the outside world, maybe the, um, any other faith that looks at us and, and says that, how we can respond and just say, well, he, he's well, not. Well, all I would say is he way. goes to confession. John Paul II, I believe, went every week. Pope Pius XII went to confession every day. Have you ever heard anyone say that the Pope, we believe the Pope is infallible? Well, we do believe he is. Yes. Okay. That's not the same thing, though. Okay, can you explain the difference? Inf infallibility means that in, in certain areas of teaching, the Pope cannot be mistaken doesn't mean that he's without sin. It means that his judgment will be assisted by the Holy Spirit to the point that the teaching will not be mistaken. That's infallibility. Father Larry, I think yeah, just by virtue, the Pope is human. We are human beings, so therefore we do sin. It just might be a, a difference in the terminology that, that I didn't understand, and also I don't think that others understand. So well, most that people don't else. understand infallibility. Even most mm -hmm. Catholics don't understand. Yeah. So it's a very limited doctrine. When I read um, some stories about saints or what you just said about the Pius XII and goes to confession every day, uh, I guess it's been my sense that the closer that people come to God and holiness in their lives, the more they'll take advantage of confession or say, mm -hmm. recognize their sinful. And I've always attributed that to increased self-awareness. Is that a correct interpretation? I think so, yes. And it's not just self-awareness, but it's an awareness of themselves before God. So faults that seem to us to be very slight to the great saints are not. Because I think they're more in touch than the rest of us are with the goodness of God. You, you, you've used a number of words, Father, and if you could make a distinction between them. Um, vice, bad habits, sin. Vice and bad, bad habits are the same thing. So, um, good habits are called virtues, bad habits are called vices. And the characteristic of a habit, let me give you Thomas's definition if I remember. It's a fixed disposition in the soul for good or for bad. Uh, because it's a fixed disposition, um, it is difficult to change. So that's why bad habits are hard to eradicate, and that's why good habits are such good things to have. So the more the good becomes habitual for us, the more we do it automatically. So when it's a fixed disposition, difficult to change in the soul, it disposes our powers well or poorly in relation to others or in relation to ourselves. So that's what a habit is. That's Thomas' definition of a habit. Mm -hmm. So the habit creates a potentiality in us, which is actuated by the act, if you will. It's brought into reality by the actual decision and act. So a good habit makes it more likely that we're going to make good decisions. And a bad habit makes it more likely that we're going to make bad decisions. And there's one last uh, term um, that's useful to know. And that is the accumulation of our habits, good and bad, is what forms our character, a person's character. So it is possible for people to act out of character. We're aware of that. We may have seen it in ourselves or we may have seen it in, in others. You know, this, this is, I mean, we kind of laugh about this, but this is particularly a problem at midlife, okay? Someone who's always driven sensible cars suddenly goes out and buys a big, expensive red sports car. That's out of character. It's out of character. Maybe the person will come to his senses and trade the red sports car in or whatever, but I hope I'm not offending anybody here. Does anybody have a red sports car? <laughs> <laughs> But, you know, and anybody can have a bad day, too, for that matter. But character is kind of the, the overall disposition a person has. And there's a very good saying about character. Character is what shows when nobody is looking. So you can be a completely virtuous person in your hometown and go visit another city to indulge all your vices, okay? What that means is you're a vicious person. 
okay? And, and what you're doing in your hometown is, is something of a lie. Does, does that answer your question? Yeah. <clears throat> yeah, but one more. There's one more word I had in there. Mm -hmm. That was sin. Mm -hmm. Is the bad habit the sin? No. The bad habit predisposes us. It's a predisposition to sin. But the sin is the act that comes about based on the habit and other circumstances. But if the bad habit is a thought, because you're in a pattern of mm -hmm. this bad thinking, isn't the thought a sin? It can be. Okay. Morality applies to acts. It applies to acts. It applies to what we do. It applies, it applies to decisions, above all, to decisions. So we may have bad habits of thought, and uh, you know, if we struggle with anger, if we're a vindictive person, for instance, um, we can imagine slights where maybe none happened. Um, you know, what that means is we're predisposed to think poorly of other people. Um, but when we actually decide to think poorly of other people, that's, there's a distinction between the predisposition and the decision. That's, can, is that clear, Nick, what I'm saying? And sin applies to the act. Sin applies to the act. But that also means conscious deliberation. Yeah. A conscious decision. Yeah, I would say that. that. I think that's implied. If it's, a, if it's a bad habit, there may not be much deliberation. There could be consciousness, but, um, you know, we're just, we're so disposed to be a, an irritable person or an impatient person or whatever. There may not be much deliberation at all. And, and actually, that's one of the strategies for dealing with um, sins of impetuosity, if you will, is try to put some distance between the impulse and what we actually decide to do about it. So, the old advice, count to ten, applies to all the vices. It really does. I heard one priest call that one the sacred pause. Yeah, that's a good way to put it. That's a good way to put it. The sacred pause. Stop and think about that before reacting. Well, especially if we're struggling with impatience or anger. Because we can do, we can really do a lot of hurt to others. So the order is important. Try to remember them, but try to remember them in, 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 uh, in order. Uh, no, on envy, you said it has no positiveness. Um, envy? envy? Yeah. Envy has no positive reward. And then you talk about it comparing yourself with others. And uh -huh. It made me think of children. Children do that a lot. Mm -hmm. uh, well, we all do that. Positive we thing. all do that. So remember, the vices are they're a twist on something that's a part of us, or, and a healthy part of us. I think it's one of the things that has made human society as great as it is among the species, mm -hmm. is that we do compare ourselves yeah. to others. So yeah. that can serve as something to, to inspire us, you know, to goad us on, or, right. or whatever. But envy is a perversion of this. It's a, it's a twist. Mm -hmm. okay. Yeah, kids do it a lot. And um, it's very, I mean, the basic advice about envy is um, stop looking at her gifts. Look at what God has given you, because God has given everyone distinctive gifts. Mm -hmm. And what you need to do is cultivate the gifts you have and not worry about somebody else's gifts. Good and the thing. people that are extraordinarily gifted, and fortunately for human society, there are a lot of them, mm -hmm. okay, face that basic maxim, to whom much is given, much is expected. So, uh, you know, it may be uncharitable, and I risk the sin of uncharity by saying this, but you look at the extraordinary gifts that have been given to the entertainment community, and then look at what they're doing with them. They will answer a divine judge for that. They will answer. And, I mean, we need to pray for them, not envy them. We need to pray for them. <clears throat> 